Well, welcome everybody. Uh, I'm uh, Ryan Miller. Uh, and I want to thank you for choosing to participate in the program today. I'll be moderating the session. Uh, today we've got a lineup here uh, talking phosphorus and, and potassium fertility, uh, broadcast for spanning. Uh, we've got two uh, guests on uh, to help us out with that. Dan Kaiser, nutrient management specialist, and uh, Jeff Betch, who's a researcher at the Southern Research and Outreach Center. We want to thank everyone for, for participating today. Uh, we do want to uh, give a shout out to some of the, the uh, generous support we received from the Minnesota Soybean uh, Research and Promotion Council, as well as the Corn Growers Research and Promotion Council to, uh, to help host uh, some of these sessions that we've been having. Uh, recordings will be made available of these. I know our first three webinar sessions are up on our YouTube channel. So if you want to check out the first uh, handful of sessions, uh, please feel free to do so. Um, the uh, A couple of housekeeping things here. Uh, we kind of changed the format of this program to make it more discussion oriented. So we're not going to have a real huge kind of an information dump uh, with, with a lot of data and things. Try to keep it more discussion oriented and question focused. And so uh, during the registration for this particular webinar, uh, we took in questions. And so we've got a list of questions that we'll work through. Uh, if we don't happen to get to all those today, we'll, we'll figure out other ways to get uh, answers out for those. Uh, but we're also are taking other questions. We'd like to keep them kind of related to the topic. So P and K. Uh, but if you're not familiar with Zoom or, or you're, you're new to this, um, we have a Q&A button if you scroll to the bottom of your screen. And for some of you, if you're in a kind of a full screen view, you may need to exit the full screen view in order to do this. But if you go down the Q&A button, you can type in a, a question if, if something pops up. Uh, and so uh, we encourage you to do that. Uh, I see there are some people already putting questions in there. Uh, also on that bottom scroll, if you scroll down there, there's a, a chat box. Uh, we'll be posting links in the chat box for uh, when we mention certain things uh, that are upcoming and, uh, and so on and so forth, uh, so that you can use those links. You can copy them out of there and, and, and uh, uh, use it at, uh, as your desire. So uh, with that, uh, we're going to get started. Um, our first, uh, we're going to have a little bit of an uh, update here from Jeff Batch. He's been leading this project on broadcast versus banning P and K. And so he's just going to give us a little synopsis on, on the project and some of the interesting things he maybe uh, has observed. And, uh, and so that's going to kind of set the, the stage for our, for our topic here today. So Jeff, when you're ready, you can take it away. All right, Ryan, thanks. Uh, I assume everyone can see my screen. So this study was funded by AFREC and is initiated in 2019. And Dan Kaiser and I have been uh, collaborating on this project. So most of you know that our current U of M fertilizer guidelines suggest a rate reduction when using band applications compared to broadcast, but only for corn. There's no adjustment or no alteration for soybean. And that's based on data from previous years. And it's been in like that in our recommendation system for quite some time. Where or when might be a band application be beneficial? Well, certainly for phosphorus and especially in high pH soils. I think the other logical situations are in strip till, ridge till, we don't have that much of anymore, in no-till situations, where you want to apply fertilizer with a band or a, pl or a planter applied uh, bands. But recognizing that, you know, we're kind of limited in, in what nutrients we can apply and how much when we look at liquid starters. And very few people have uh, dry starter equipment on their planters anymore. It's just too heavy, too costly. But there are opportunities with RTK to place a band of dry fertilizer and still do conventional tillage or, or conservation tillage. So those are some options that growers could have. In this study, we looked and I'm going to focus primarily on uh, a couple of things grain yield obviously and I'll also talk a little bit about leaf uh, ear leaf P and K nutrient concentrations and we're going to talk about some soil test comparisons. So this study was a band side by side band P versus or band P or K side by side uh, study where we had a wide range of soil tests. The band was applied with our small plot applicator about six inches deep right where the row was going to be. So the fertilizer is probably about four inches below the seed when the seed was planted. 
and this was a conservation tillage system. So we came back in the spring and did a one pass with a field cultivator to a depth that was a little shallower than that. So we really wouldn't have disturbed that band very much or at all. <clears throat> we had two locations, Waseca, a clay loam glacial till soil and Rochester, a silt loam lust soil. So we're just gonna look at a few pictures and these pictures are all from Waseca site. We had some good visual differences there. This first one on the left, you can see the person standing back here in the back. He's kind of splitting the, the small, the two small plots. On the left, we have the broadcast K treatment and on the right, we have the banded treatment. And you can clearly see the banded treatment has greater growth, it's taller, and you see less firing of the leaves edges. And you'll see that again in a moment here in another picture. This picture on the right side, this uh, top from the tail, sorry about that, it, uh, it splits the two plots. We got the band application on the right, the broadcast treatment on the left. And you can see the firing along the edges of the leaves and a lot less growth. And this soil test at this plot was much lower than the one over here on the left. So this is the same plot that I showed on the right in the previous picture. It's just a few days later and a, a better photo to see when the sun angle wasn't quite so glary. So this site or this plot got 60 pounds of K2O per acre broadcast and it had a soil test of 84 part per million using the dry conventional ammonium acetate extraction. And those soil tests came from the 2019 growing season. You compare that to the one on the right that got 60 pounds in a band and it had a soil test of 86. So you can see these were very similar and you can see a significant amount more growth and less firing as you can see some of the firing here on the edges at this leaf that came from this plot here. This was the phosphorus site at Waseca. On the left, this side received 45 pounds of P205 per acre as uh, applied in a band compared to on the right of this stick, which received the broadcast. Again, you see a lot more grow early or taller growth, more leaf area, as you can also see the amount of light that's coming through this plot compared to this one. This site or this plot or pair of plots at Waseca had a very low soil test. It was only a two or three part per million would be uh, very unusual to find that a low soil test. So these sites are were pretty unique and they had a wide range in soil tests. Some results from 2020. So we'll look at Waseca site for phosphorus. So we have the banded P treatments and the broadcast P and these are preliminary results. So for this comparison, I just took all the comparisons we had and took a mean or average of them. And this is averaged across some of these plots received 30 pounds and some that had lower soil tests received 45 pounds of K2O or a P2O in this P205 in this example. So the soil tests from the previous year, you can see that they were very similar, averaged across all the plots. The ear leaves were similar. There were no differences between band and broadcast. And at the Waseca site for phosphorus, we saw no yield difference between band and broadcast. Now, these two treatments are kind of our controls. This is a, a should respond to fertilizer, low control. It did not get, the, neither of these got fertilizer. So these are low soil test areas that should have a yield reduction. Um, due to low soil test phosphorus. And these are areas that had high soil test phosphorus and should serve as a optimally fertilized control. You look at this STP less than 10 part per million and the average of the soil tests of all those plots was eight and a half. The ear leaf P was just a little bit lower and the yields were numerically lower, whether that'll be statistically significant or not, we'll have to wait and see when I get the stats done uh, later this month or early next month. Um, when we look at the high soil testing areas, you see the ear leaf P is greater and you see the yields are greater. Certainly, this will be a significant difference between the, the 10 and the, the less than or equal to 10 and the greater than or equal to 16. Um, when we go down to the Rochester site, same kind of a idea, but you see not very much for differences in ear leaf P, except for when we get to this greater than 16 part per million and really just small numerical differences in grain yield. So it doesn't look like we're really gonna see a P response at this site, um, either to band or broadcast or to even fertile or high fertility or high phosphorus fertility or low phosphorus fertility. The last slide I have 
is this one for potassium, a similar approach. We've got the banded K, we got the broadcast K. These were applied at either 45 or 60 pounds of K2O per acre with the lower soil test plots having the lower or the higher rate. When we look at the comparison of the two side by sides, the soil tests were very equal. The ear leaves were similar, maybe a little bit better for banded K and we didn't really see a yield advantage at Waseca site. However, I do believe that I'm not convinced that with the really um, differences that we saw visually, I'm not convinced that this didn't, that there was something else that may have been limiting yield at this location a little bit. The, these treatments received 60 pounds broadcast annually since 2016. You can see it has a higher soil test than these it didn't have any greater ear leaf and it actually had numerically less yield. You compare that to this plot, which received 120 pounds of K2O broadcast annually since 2016. Now you see the soil test increase, the ear leaf concentration at R1, R2 increased dramatically. But again, only small numerical differences in yield. But this treatment is definitely greater than that treatment. We go down to Rochester. Um, the band versus broadcast, the same rates as Waseca. The broadcast looked like it had greater ear leaf K, but the banded treatments had greater yield, 10 bushels more. Compare that to the 60 pound broadcast annually, which had a soil test that was slightly greater and would have been very similar to this treatment other than soil test K levels. It had higher ear leaf K, but did not have greater yields than the broadcast K treatment here. And then when we get to the 120 pound treatment, we have much greater soil test K, a much greater ear leaf K and similar yields to the banded treatment. So here at the Rochester site for K, it, it appears that the banded treatment or the band application did have an advantage. We could use a lower rate and get a similar or even slightly numerically greater yield. So that's what I have to get the discussion started. Ryan, I'll send it back to you. All right, thanks, Jeff. Uh, I'll start off with Dan. Did, Dan, did you want to make any comments uh, on this on the study, or, or give us any insight on from your perspective? Uh, I don't have any major comments. Uh, Jeff, I think covered most of it. Um, there's been more questions. Um, if anybody has been kind of following our guidelines, I did make some changes, particularly to the phosphorus guidelines, adding in a set of general recommendations for a maintenance style program. So there's been some questions related to banding. Um, I've been kind of holding back. A little bit on you know general thoughts until we get some of this data for this study that Jeff talked about together first because that's one of the I think the key things that um, we need to make sure that this efficiency is there and that's kind of the the big thing right now with moving forward with our recommendations um, just to make sure that's the right decision for most growers um, whether we keep that efficiency rating or not. Ryan, uh, I, Ryan, I would add that I forgot to mention that this study will continue in 2021 and it'll be corn again. Okay, excellent. Yeah, I look forward to seeing some more results, kind of see if you're seeing similar things from year to year. Um, so uh, uh, I guess there's one general question that came in right away, guys, just maybe uh, briefly, there was a K2O, all right? The, the question is, what is K2O? If you want to just explain that, that was a, a general question that came in, I think would be important to so the K2O is just the, uh, the nutrient that we use in our recommendations, but it's, it would be 60 pounds of K2O would be 100 pounds of potash or OO60. Okay, excellent. Thanks, Jeff. Um, so Dan, back to you, I guess. Uh, you know, there's a lot of talk about different approaches to fertility when it comes to P and K sufficiency versus maintenance. I don't know if you want to make any comments on that and how that might relate to using one of these application strategies? Well, when I started looking at some of our data, this has been something that's been in the mill for a while, uh, looking at maintenance style strategies, a lot of growers are doing it. Um, so one of the things that I did, and Jeff and I kind of conversed a little bit on this was, you know, making a decision if we did have to use a maintenance style strategy, you know, how would we go about doing that? So I wanted to look at the economics of it and um, just see where things are at, particularly for a broadcast application. I mean, I, I guess the question I, I said before is gonna be moving forward is can we maintain 
some of these band efficiencies because I know a lot of you the banding there was a question um, on one of my earlier meetings um, I think back in December on uh, you know whether you know banding removal rates is something we should be looking at doing and, and it's it's going to be a question of this whole efficiency factor uh, because one of the things that we see particularly with P and K is that there's a lot of flexibility in terms of what you can do uh, particularly you start getting into medium to high soil test categories you get to a situation where the soil has the capacity to supply many of the nutrients uh, in terms of rates uh, you know we don't have to be very prescriptive on hitting exact rates and starter based strategies we know can work and so it's you know there's not one size fits all things so that's kind of the focus i had moving forward with our guidelines is trying to hit producer goals and some questions we've been sitting and just laying out just some particular strategies because again um, there's there's probably a best strategy that fits for a given field in a given year, but not across all the fields across the state. Ryan, I would add that, you know, when I think of sufficiency versus build and maintain or that type of an approach or idea, I always often think of rented versus owned ground. If it's rented ground, I mean, a sufficiency approach makes a lot of sense. You don't know how long you're going to have that unless it's grandma's or your uncle Joe, and he's going to, you know, as long as you're farming, he's going to let you farm it. But if it's ground that it looks like a short-term rent or lease, a sufficiency approach where you're just applying, trying to keep those soil tests in the medium category and just applying what the crop needs, is going to probably give you your greatest return on investment. And then the other factor that does come into play is the overall ag economy. And clearly with the price changes we've seen in commodities this, over the last few months, um, that may change growers' you know, ideas a little bit. But generally when you get these periods where you're in a tougher economy, the sufficiency approach may make your bottom line each individual year better. All right. So along, along that line, so if I, if I want to use a sufficiency approach and, uh, and say I'm in that medium category, uh, you know, on, on a soil kind of more in the central part of the state, not the far west, uh, you know, where we are having pH issues, um, what kind of uh, recommendations? If you're not going with crop removal rate, what kind of guidelines do you provide as far as a, a percent of that or, or some other uh, algorithm, whatever you use to determine what you might, uh, might be applying or want to apply? Well, the sufficiency approach relies on a couple things. I mean, it's going to rely, you know, well, like the build, what I mean, maintenance is it's soil testing. So you need to have an accurate reading of your starting point. And that's really what's critical now. There's a lot of debate then in terms of, you know, grid versus zone, you know, how accurate can you get in terms of a given field, but that's really the, the good starting point. I mean, if you're dealing with medium or high testing soils already, um, you know, it, it becomes the rate side, you know, again, starter only tends to work. So to me, the rate side becomes less important. It's really making sure that you're not seeing some of those low testing areas that you're under fertilizing in that. And that's really, I think, where you have to be careful so where soil sampling really comes into play. And then the second is just picking um, kind of a good target yield or um, what I call more of a proven yield, just taking kind of what you know you can produce from those fields just to make sure you're not under fertilizing. Um, but, you know, the thing with P and K, one thing that we see is that, you know, plus minus a few pounds of, of fertilizer really doesn't matter quite as much. It's not going to be as stark of a yield reduction as we'd see with nitrogen. So, you know, we have some flexibility that we don't have to hit exactly, but the main thing with the sufficiency approach is since you're applying less fertilizer is again, soil testing regularly enough where you're kind of seeing where the soil test is gonna go because that's, I know one of the, the main questions on that is, is when you're dealing with lower fertilizer rates, particularly in the medium class is that if you see it drop down, you've, you've gotta be able to catch it when it does drop to make sure you're applying enough, particularly if it gets into a more responsive soil test range. Right. Yeah, I would. I would add that, uh, you know, think about your soil tests as even if you don't apply, say for phosphorus anyway, if you take a year or two and you don't apply, your soil tests aren't going to crash in, in one or two growing seasons. And typically our long-term data shows if you started out in the 20 to 25 part per million Bray P and you didn't apply for five years, the soil test would probably decline about 1.8 to 1.9 part per million per year. So you're not going to end up um, extraordinarily deficient in just a matter of a couple growing seasons. So if you're looking at a reduced rate or what would that number be, you could probably apply one third or to one half of crop removal 
and maintain those soil tests in that around 20 part per million, which I think is a great strategy for own ground. Now on rented ground and short-term leases, maybe you want to be even lower, target a lower soil test than that. Okay, ex excellent. Uh, so heard from Dan that soil testing is critical. Now, Dan, do you want to maybe address best practices around soil sampling, soil testing for in terms of frequency and, and time of year, anything like that? Frequency wise, you know, I've, we've got quite a few growers that I think, I don't know, Jeff, you could probably chime in maybe every four years or so that are sampling some of these fields. Um, I know with some of the NRCS, their recommendations right now, I think they're recommending more frequent sampling. And I think certainly, um, you know, I think rented ground, if you're, you're kind of running that fine line in that medium classification, you may want to look at sampling a little more frequently um, just to make sure that you're not, you know, getting your soil, you're, is if you run that fine line between low to medium, um, you, you want to make sure that you're putting enough fertilizer on at that, that given point. Um, in terms of sampling, like I said, grid versus zone, um, you know, there's, I think, a, a probably a best practice for some fields. Uh, certainly, if you're going into a new field, you know, maybe a denser grid would be nice just to see what variability you have out there. But you have other tools like your yield maps and stuff. I think you can kind of use maybe to eventually judge how things are at. So I think just use all the information you have to see what's the best best option for those fields. So that's, I guess, kind of the thing in terms of timing, it, it's really gonna depend. And I said, if I have a, more of a sufficiency rating, I, I would probably try to go to a more frequent sampling. Okay, uh, so question around uh, soil test type. So Bray versus Olson, and then this the Malik 3 extraction that uh, certain commercial labs provide results in those. Um, you guys want to talk about where each of those might fit or not fit and some of the cautions you might suggest. So we recommend the Bray and the Olson in Minnesota mainly because we have calibrations for those particular tests. Um, as Ryan said, more of the labs now are using the Malik 3. Um, the Malik 3, uh, the results, um, if you look at the Malik 3, how it's analyzed, the extraction solution, uh, there's a couple different ways they read the phosphorus that's in those solutions. One is a method we call colorometrically, um, which essentially is just um, you put a compound in, it develops a color. It's the way that you do with the Bray. If you look at a colorometric versus a Bray colorometric for Malik 3 versus a Bray, you should get roughly the same results. And you could use roughly the same calibration for kind of, you know, moderately alkaline, maybe soils less than a pH of 7.4. So we know it will work in some circumstances. Um, a lot of labs now are, are running their samples um, and determining with uh, ICP, which the challenge with that determination is that it extracts organic P, the Malik 3 does, so the ICP will read that. So they'll generally come back 20% higher and you need a different calibration. So essentially it becomes somewhat of a different test. So it's one of the things with these tests, you just need to make sure that in terms of the what you're, looking at for the numbers that the interpretation you can use is the same and that's really what's most important and the other thing um, most in-state labs are going to run either the the Bray or the Olson which I think are probably the best to run if you are sending them out state some labs will run a Malik 3 then back convert it to a Bray and Olson based on in-house correlations which has some danger uh, mainly for soils high in carbonates um, I've seen situations where the Malik 3 kind of falls apart in some of those. Uh, for the majority of you, though, if you're dealing with, um, you know, moderately alkaline, again, 7.4 or less, I don't think it's going to be that big of an issue. Um, but there can be some circumstance, and it's why we're not recommending the Malik 3 is for some of the high pH, high carbonate situations. Okay, excellent. Uh, there are a number of questions related to no-till and conservation till and, and, and fertility strategies. You guys want to make start with any kind of general comments or accommodations you need to consider when that's your situation where you're in a, a conservation or a no-till uh, uh, planting regime? You know, I think that the first thing when you think of no-till, strip-till is banding uh, is probably going to be part of that, of that system. And maybe even a starter band or some starter a starter nutrient, be it nitrogen, phosphorus combination, something like 10-34-0, may go along, but you're going to need to figure out how you're going to apply the rest of your P and K. Because I, in general, you're not probably not going to want to apply all your phosphorus as 10-34-0. So in strip-till, it seems logical and practical. And I know one of the questions is, 
Um, it takes more time. Should I just broadcast? Well, from a phosphorus standpoint, there's two main reasons to, to ban. And one is from the environmental standpoint. You know, if you're in no-till or strip-till and you leave that phosphorus fertilizer on the soil surface, if you got some slope in your ground in southeast Minnesota or somewhere else where there's some rolling topography, you run the risk of a, a rain potentially uh, washing that off and, and getting it into surface waters. And you're going to end up with a lot of stratification of phosphorus near the surface of the soil. Now, potassium is a different story. Um, think of the, the corn and soybean plant as like a pump. It pumps potassium out of the soil and brings it up into the tissue. And then most of it, and soybeans have a, have a higher crop removal of potassium than corn. But in corn, most of it's in the tissue and the stock, and it just recycles back to the top of the soil. But if you're not doing a tremendous amount of tillage, if you're in a true no-till situation, you're leaving all that K on the soil surface. So banding some K and getting it below the surface of the soil is important. Now, it's probably not as important for phosphorus. Uh, the plants will take it up just fine if it's near the soil surface, but then you have that environmental component. And I'll let, I'll let uh, Dan see if he wants to add anything. No, I mean, Jeff, I think you covered most of it. Um, you know, if you look at a lot of the data, the, the yield wise, it doesn't seem to make as big of a difference band versus broadcast, particularly for medium or higher testing soils uh, for a, like a no-till situation based on what I've seen. So K is, I think, the big one to be more concerned about. Um, I mean, I would caution, though, I mean, in those circumstances, I mean, a starter would be, I think, a good option. I mean, if you're looking at a broadcast and a reduced till situation, at least have something there early, particularly as far north as we are with that. So I think there's some benefit there, but uh, potassium is going to be, you know, you look historically, a lot of the data from Ridge till and a lot of the other band, it's been kind of the issue when it comes to reduced till situations, making sure there's something deeper that um, the soils dry out, the plant can still access the source of that uh, nutrient. You know, one of the questions I saw in your list here, Ryan, was someone asked about the time it takes to, to uh, band as P and K and strip till and would it be better and would it be cheaper to broadcast it? And I think there are situations, especially over the last three or four years, I can remember where we had very wet falls and the amount of days or opportunities of days to go out there and do strip till in good conditions was challenging. And if that's the case, and if saving the time of, of not having to put to ban that P and K and just, and, and just broadcast it, if you did that once in a while, I don't think broadcasting would be a big problem in a, in a strip till situation. But I think if you have the time, you're better off putting it in the band. Well, I think that's getting through a lot of our conservation questions. There is a, well, actually there's a couple that popped in here. Um, any, uh, are you guys studying at all the, the band placement in relation to the seed? And you may want to make any comments with banding and, and seed placement and, and anything to consider there? I mean, I really haven't seen anything where we've been looking at different um, distances from the seed. I mean, most of the time we, we tend to, particularly with high fertilizer rates in a band, try to get at least an inch of uh, soil between the, the seed and the band. Uh, but it, you know, it kind of, kind of depend on what you're banding to because some materials are gonna be less risky than others. Um, the majority of what we've kind of looked at have been more of like a two by two system versus an in furrow system, just looking at overall risk for seedling damage. But, um, you know, I haven't seen anything, Jeff. I don't know if you have, um, you know, we've been looking at some surface dribble band as well, but most of it, we've just been targeting a, a set distance and not looking at kind of what that tolerable, tolerable distance is from the seed itself. Yeah, I noticed there's a, there was a question there too about, could we put air, all of our nutrients on with the planter? And I think the, the answer is kind of yes and no. Yes, you could, but it may not be a good idea. And it gets back to just what Dan was saying. There's certain nutrients that there's some salt effects. There's some distance that has to be, it has to be away from the seed. You, you know, phosphorus and a little bit of nitrogen is okay in the seed, near the seed or on the seed and maybe a little bit of potassium. But when you start thinking of KCL, um, ammonium thiosulfate, uh, urea, these are, these are fertilizers that you don't want very close to the, to the seedlings and is two inches of separation enough. Sure. If you're putting on, you know, say 150 or 200 pounds of uh nine, 23, 30, but if you're going to put on all your N, P, K and S for a given growing season, 
I don't think two inches is going to be a, a far enough distance. Plus, we just don't have, you know, there still are planters out there to put on dry, but there just aren't very many of them. And your options of putting on all your nutrients with liquids is somewhat limited and it's going to be uh, more costly. I mean, urea is your problem, really. I mean, just anything that's going to liberate ammonia. Um, you know, if you've got dry soil or anything where that band can kind of creep towards the seed, it might be an issue. So that's the one I mean, I really focus on. But, but fortunately, though, if you look at nitrogen, we have more flexibility in terms of what we can do. So you don't necessarily need to put that all on with the planter. You could come back post planting and uh, with a side dress application and put something else on, um, even sling urea on the surface and have you know, just as, as good results. I mean, it depends on the tillage system in terms of what I'd recommend, but there is flexibility out there for that. But P and K, um, it's less of an issue. It's mostly the, uh, the urea or any, any nitrogen um, ammonia liberating fertilizer source is just going to be the issue. I mean, I can go back to, to showing how old I am, but growing up on the farm, I mean, that was a common practice. We put on 150, 200 pounds of 923.30. And then we, you know, either put on the rest of our nitrogen as either UAN when we put on pre-emerge herbicides or anhydrous or whatever, and that was it. That's all we did year after year after year. Uh, thanks, Jeff and Dan. Uh, one question here, uh, talking about banding, is there an ideal depth of band when you're, when you're looking at banding depth? Um, I think when you're looking at, you know, again, when we're talking about some of these nutrients like uh, potash and certainly like urea, you got to make sure that that space between that seedling or that uh, seed is, is distant is enough distance. Now, when you're looking at things like, uh, you know, MAP or DAP, it's probably not a big deal, especially for corn. Um, so the one factor as far as for potassium is going is goes is the depth probably isn't that critical. You know, I, I think at least four inches and deeper is okay. Now for phosphorus, if you're trying to get that starter effect and you're in a strip till, our no-till system, and you put that phosphorus at eight inches deep in a strip-till band, you're probably not going to get that early starter type effect unless you also have a small amount of dribble, you know, starter in contact with the seed. And I did a lot of work with this kind of stuff in the late 90s and early 2000s, and, and that was pretty typical. It doesn't necessarily mean that that's going to reduce yields. And, and, you know, starter, as Dan will say, on your high-testing soils, generally does not give a huge return on investment. Um, it's more of a makes the crop look better and makes me feel better situation. Okay, uh, back to more of a conventional tillage uh, question here. Um, this one talking about uh, K and P, uh, is it better to chisel it in if you're in that system or do it after you're done with fall tillage? Make your broadcast application. Just from a water quality standpoint, particularly with phosphorus, I mean, it's, it's a good idea to work it in because, I mean, tillage is a best management practice when it comes to phosphorus application with fall, particularly the later you go, um, because really the one challenge with, with both P and K is it does take some time for them to dissolve and react with the soil. So that's the main thing. If you want to hold them in where you're at, um, you need some time. So, you know, if that is your option, I would get it, try to get them before tillage if you can. Um, if you can't, try to get them applied as early as possible in the fall to give them some time to react with the soil because we want to we want to make sure that um, if you get a you know substantial rainfall, we've got some of that material or a lot of that material that's not in, in a form that's going to wash right out the field. Yeah, I would add that, you know, if you've got sloping soils, especially in southeast Minnesota, um, and you're concerned about putting P and K out there in the fall and then uh, either leaving it lay on the surface or you just don't want to do fall tillage after soybean on soybean stubble in the fall, which in those parts of the state, you really shouldn't. Then you can consider just holding off that application until spring. And I know that's not ideal from a compaction standpoint and it's maybe not ideal from a time management in the spring, but you could put that application of P and K on, uh, maybe put some urea, uh, and also, or some AMS all at the same time, do your one pass tillage and go ahead and plant. And then you'd take that whole concern away. Uh, this question is a little bit longer. I'm just going to read it verbatim here. Uh, would you explain your recommendations about potassium fertilization and soybeans in your corn soybean rotation? There seems to be more information on the best way and most economical way. Uh, should we fertilize every other year before corn and plan on an extra for the soybeans? 
know, that kind of depends on the situation. And I've seen more growers, particularly with potash, um, you know, since potassium is a higher remover of potash going to some application ahead of the beans. And the data that I have, um, you know, there are some instances where the split, you know, every year does work. I think it's tied, um, looking at some of my soils to soils that are low CEC. So, you know, maybe, you know, some sandier soils. I don't know, some of the the silt loams we don't always get in the southeast get a high response rate to those. So I think in every other year application head of the corn can make a difference. Uh, the main thing that I, I kind of want growers to avoid is high application rates ahead of soybean. And, um, you know, this kind of can come into play with those that are trying to change base saturation or do some things that um, are trying to, uh, you know, move the K content higher that, you um, we do see some issues and, and I've got data now, you know, pointing that it's, it's specifically chloride in the potash that's giving us some problems with yield reductions. In most cases, uh, most growers are probably only catching maybe a one bushel reduction. So in the grand scheme of things, they're really not going to notice it all that much. But um, there are some issues there, particularly with um, K, whether it's applied either the fall or the spring ahead of the beans. So, you know, what I really recommend, uh, if you're going to do that, you know, 40 units of K2O, you know, mo no more than maybe 100 pounds of actual potash per acre ahead of the beans but I just I think the two-year spreads seem to still work okay particularly for um, you know more neutral to acidic soils um, because you can get P and K um, you don't have too much issue with phosphorus as well so you can put those two together so you don't know Jeff if you have any comments no I I think what you said is just spot on the only thing I would add is if you're already in the high and very high categories that annual versus biennial application isn't going to make any difference, certainly isn't going to make any difference. Okay, uh, I do want to call attention that we uh, kind of scheduled this for a half hour. We've exceeded our half hour at the current time. Uh, there were a number of nitrogen related questions, uh, which I put a link into the chat. Uh, there is a nitrogen management conference coming up here in February. Uh, that's on the 9th, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think that was the 9th. Uh, yeah. And uh, so there's a link there that you can, you can uh, uh, sign in there and, and take that in and, and maybe get your question addressed there. Otherwise, through our other nutrient management podcasts and some of the crop news uh, situations, we'll try to, to uh, deal with some of these questions as we move forward. We're not going to have time today to get to it. We're going to stick on the P and K uh, questions. Uh, I also want to mention there was one question about soil pH and adjusting soil pH. Uh, we're going to be back on February 17th, 8.30 in the morning, the same kind of format with Dan and Jeff again talking about soil pH. And so we're going to save that for, for that discussion that day. Um, but anyways, uh, with that, if, if you want to stick on, you're more than welcome to. I'm going to kind of keep working through these, uh, Dan and Jeff, as long as you're willing to participate. We'll get through the rest of these questions that have popped into the chat, or q and I should say, and, uh, and we'll kind of work through this. Uh, let's see here. Um, have you ever seen, when we're talking about some of the, the research work you guys have done, um, differences in stock quality or standability uh, with different treatments and fertility. Yeah, in our K studies, um, as I mentioned, we have some pretty low soil tests in some of those plots. And it, it, as we drew, drew down some of those uh, certain individual treatments to very low levels, we definitely had some issues with standability and stock quality. And actually just uh, the other thing in corn, we would see premature um, basic uh, senescence or the crop would just shut down early and uh, it's some pretty large yield differences. But as far as, as uh, inadequately fertilized treatments, I don't think placement or, or uh, soil fertility level or rate has that much of an effect as long as it's not, like I said, in a very deficient scenario. Well, one of the things I see too quite a bit, Jeff, and I don't know if you see this with potassium, is we do tend to pick up um, increased grain moisture at harvest. I mean, it's almost, I mean, a linear increase with increasing rates of K. So that tells me that something about in terms of the plant being, um, or not shutting down quite as quickly and, and dying as quickly in the fall. And soybean, I kind of see some of the same things that affects protein as well. Um, you don't necessarily see the, the moisture differences just because it's soybean and they tend to be dry anyway. But that's 
one thing we do pick up, um, you know, quite often, and I think that's really attributed to the, um, you know, the, the quality or the health of the plant is that um, increase in, in grain moisture with increasing rate of K. Yeah, and I would, I would add that that can interact with uh, the genetics of the crop. You know, some, some hybrids have that stay green, but it also can interact with whether a grower used a fungicide. And yeah, I, I would agree with you, Dan. I've seen that too in our data where, where uh, you got high K fertility and maybe the grain moisture, the plant will stay green a little longer and you might have higher grain moisture. Uh, back, Dan, you addressed this question a little bit earlier. We were talking about soil sampling. I don't know if you hit this point exactly, uh, but there's a question here. When is the best time for soil sampling? Yeah, I saw that question come in and I didn't catch it on that last question. Um, you know, for pea uh, micros, I don't think it really matters. Um, fall versus spring, it's really potassium. That's one of the things that we're looking at right now. Um, when's the best time of sampling just to give us the best judgment of our actual K level because we do see that um, as you go to the middle part of the season, particularly as the plant is drying up a lot of K, the soil test drops. And as you go into the fall, it increases and it'll drop towards the spring. So it does this. And we see that wave pattern over time. And, you know, Jeff, I know we've been looking at more spring and early summer. I mean, I think that early June, uh, particularly if you do a two-year spread ahead of corn, you can sample in the bean year. If it's corn bean rotation, I think it's a good option. Um, just to give a good assessment of where the potassium is. But the potassium is going to be your main issue that you're going to want to look at in terms of timing because that's where we see the most uh, site or what I call this yearly cycle of what's going on, which can, can impact your overall read on, on what the test is. I have a question that popped in here. They have missed part of this presentation. And so, yeah, we're recording it. Uh, I put a link in the chat side uh, to, to where you can find uh, the recordings. Uh, it'll take a little time. We have to transcribe this into a, a printed format too. So uh, it won't be up today necessarily, but uh, shortly after the presentation today, you will be able to see this um, online if you missed some of it. Uh, let's see here, we got a couple of other questions. Uh, one is just kind of a general, why don't we see much ridge till anymore? I don't know, Jeff, I think a lot of it's because of strip till, you know, just having some other options out there, but um, you know, it. I don't know, Jeff, do you have any comments on this? Um, you know, I think the first thing I would say was just the uh, iron costs a lot more now than it did 30 years ago. And uh, when I think of ridge till, I think of a lot of big, big iron to cultivate. I think that one thing that is interesting, Ryan, and you being a weed science agronomist, uh, with some of our challenging weeds that uh, we can't seem to kill with different brands of herbicide that we always used to kill, maybe cultivation will become... Uh, a thing again, at least for some growers, maybe not growers that farm several thousand acres, but for some. And if that's the case, uh, maybe maybe ridge till will make a, a comeback. I don't know. Yeah, a return to ridging for weed management. So we'll, we'll keep that in the, the back burner there and I'll talk to Devlin about that. But anyways, uh, good thoughts there, Jeff. Um, I see uh, someone added, asked a question about broadcasting and then if there's a preference on direction of how you would work it in with the rows or at an angle, or if that really makes a difference, if you have any thoughts. I don't know if it makes a whole lot of difference. I mean, I think the thing about if you go at an angle, um, if you know, you, you think about how the accuracy, you know, a lot of the airflow units, you think you get a pretty even spread across the, the width of the, the spreader, but with some spinners, you know, maybe an angle might be better to kind of move it more side to side, but I don't think it really matters um, either way. I mean, it's, you know, looking at it in terms of it, just whether it gets, it gets mixed and usually the plants somehow going to find the roots are going to find where that fertilizer is. Well, that's some good thoughts. Uh, so we got a question here. Uh, have you seen a difference in types of strip till rigs? Knives with fertilizer is at the bottom versus the coulter rig that kind of you know, does more of the mixing action. Um, any thoughts on, on whether you'd see a difference with that or, or any, any discussion, I guess? I think it would be a, an interesting study. And I've, uh, I've thought about this on a few occasions. The, the problem is, is I don't know that we would see enough differences to justify the time and effort it would take to, to really come up with an answer. One thing that I would say is that uh, when you use a knife unit in strip till, you often till between six and eight inches deep. And most of the fertilizer in that band ends up at the very bottom of that strip. It's hard to keep it up. 
and distribute it throughout that vertical profile if, if you if people if the listeners can understand what I'm saying so that makes soil sampling a challenge because when you soil sample if your fertilizer is down in your band at eight inches deep and you're only sampling six inches deep you may not hit that band with with your soil sampling at six inches deep and it's going to look like your soil soil test levels after several years are crashing where the the coulter machines generally go, do not go as deep and the fertilizer is kind of mixed throughout the whole profile of the tillage area. So when you're sampling and you sample between the row and some samples in the row, you're going to get that, that band. And I think it's going to uh, be easier to keep track and to monitor your soil test levels if you are not putting that fertilizer quite so deep. Um. There are a couple of questions on base saturation. I'm not sure exactly where they're going with these uh, questions, but anything you guys want to comment on base saturation or? That's something I've been getting more questions on recently. Um, you mean the main drawbacks you look at it in, ter in terms of changing your base saturation in high clay soil? I mean, really the main drawback is it's going to take a lot of potassium to do it. I mean, I think some of the recommendation I've seen um, have been upwards of 600 units K2O. I mean, it's been a lot of material. To do it. I mean, I think actually to do it, you need more than that, but I think to kind of cap the recommendations off at a certain point where it seems that it's a little more palatable. But, you know, if you look at 600 pounds K2O, you know, at 30 cents a pound, that's $180 an acre. I mean, that's a lot of money to be dropping in potassium when there's zero data out there that shows that, um, you know, modifying or doing those extreme modifications are going to work. I mean, I would look at that's what I'm trying to look at now with some of my longer term work, just to see kind of how we've changed things with some more moderate applications. Um, because in a lot of that study, we see that the yield too. So, I mean, that's really the main thing is it's cost. I mean, can you afford, or are you going to recover that amount of cost? Uh, the other thing too, is um, some of this chloride work I have on beans. I mean, I would not be doing anything like this ahead of beans. I mean, even that high of rate could reduce corn yield. So we've seen NDSU's recommendations, they've seen anything higher than about 200 pounds of potash, seeing, seeing yield tail off just a little bit. Um, you know, some of the data I had for Morris for beans, we had an 18 bushel yield reduction um, for, it was roughly the same amount of potash applied. And that was a dry, dry year with that. So, I mean, you're, you're looking at a lot of risks there for essentially little reward on, on based on data that's come out of, um, very limited research out of Missouri and New Jersey. I mean, it's a lot, it's really old data and it's on sandier soils where it's a lot easier to change these things. And that's the thing, it's just, just whether or not you can change it, it takes a lot of material and it's, it's the additional costs, it's really not gonna be worth it. You know, potassium is one of those nutrients that you can get luxury consumption with. And it, it, one of the roles it serves in the plant is charge balance. So, you know, every time you take up a, a positively charged K plus um, you can balance the, uh, an anion, say nitrate. But if you flush and flood the system with potassium, you can actually maybe potentially screw that up a little bit. And uh, I think this gets at, or it's, a, it's one explanation of how applying too much K could actually reduce yields. It's, you know, it's one, one way or one method or explanation of how that could happen. Okay. Uh Guys, we got one kind of last question. I'm going to paraphrase it a little bit. Uh, it's curious about uh, P and K and how other nutrients might impact uptake. If there's anything you would like to mention in regards to nutrient uptake and how something might affect uptake. I guess their focus was micronutrients, but I, you know, generally, uh, if there's anything you want to talk about here, um, have at it. I'll let, I'll let Dan touch this one, but I will, I will put in a plug. I think Dan was at a month or two months ago, we did a, a soil fertility podcast on nutrient interactions. Um, and I think we touched on P and, and zinc, and I'm trying to remember which other ones, nitrogen and sulfur, those are the keys. Yeah, I mean, this is, you know, thanks Jeff for, for putting me on the spot here, but uh but uh, I mean, this is one of the things that does, you have to consider. And one of the things that, when it comes to these interactions, really, um, the thing that that's of more importance is, you know, kind of what I call the foundational nutrients, you know, NPKS, 
I mean, those are likely going to have a bigger impact on micronutrients versus what micronutrients are going to have on those. It's just because of the amount that's being taken up. And we see this a lot with nitrogen. I mean, nitrogen, you, you limit N uptake, you can screw a lot of other things up just because the plant isn't, the roots aren't actively growing and getting to new areas of the soil that have some of these micros that they, they need to take up. So I don't think you're going to see as much impact of the micros on the macros. I um, mean, the, the main interactions we see a lot are um, nitrogen with sulfur. Um, those two can interact with each other where you have low sulfur, it can lead to poor N uptake um, or vice versa. I mean, I see a lot of times my low sulfur plots have really severe nitrogen deficiencies. Uh, nitrogen and potassium is another one um, that does tend to come up. Um, you know, I think um, nitrogen is going to be more limiting probably in most cases then, but I know Jeff, you saw some things that look like on your some of those studies, you had those banded studies, you're showing that you had nitrogen deficiency showing up in some of the low K plots. And with phosphorus, um, tends to, the uptake tends to happen independently of most everything else. Um, there is always a talk of phosphorus and zinc um, in terms of the two acting together. I think some of the issues with high zinc is that it can react with the phosphorus. So it isn't, it's, isn't necessarily an uptake issue as much as it is the happening in the soil, maybe some reaction before, but, you know, typically I, I don't see too many issues because where we tend to get to high zinc situations, maybe our mineral situations with the phosphorus as high as, as well. So, I mean, I, I guess if you want to know more, yeah, that podcast would be a good one to go back to as we talk about, about many of these things. And, um, you know, when it comes to tissue analysis, if some of you are using it and looking at some of these things, I always stress, look at your main macronutrients first and if one of those is an issue, um, don't read too much farther into it because I think they're more likely going to drive lower micronutrient uptake um, versus, um, you know, some of these things with micronutrients, you know, driving issues with macronutrients because the, the difference there in terms of uptake is so, so steep. Yeah, I think that last comment, Dan, is so, so important, especially during these vegetative stages, rapidly growing stages, especially like in corn. Um, worrying about these micronutrient deficiencies in a tissue test when corn is at the V10, V12, V14 stage, uh, the crop is, is growing so rapidly that the dilution effect of, of these nutrients that are in low concentration, um, it, can, it can cause it to be low, but it doesn't mean it's deficient. It doesn't mean it's going to have any effect on the crop's production. And with right. potassium, I've seen it quite a bit. I mean, in the Southeast, we've had some situations with very high yielding crops that if you took the, the K test, the tissue would, it would, it was really low on it. And I don't know, you know, if I added more, if it would have helped. I mean, I was dealing with, you know, yields that were, you know, 250 plus in some of those. So, you know, the thing about it is that hybrids have their specific, you know, probably optimal concentrations and it's, there's just a lot of variability with it. But um, again, you know, focus on your foundation, the NPKS, and focus on that first. If there's an issue there, I mean, that's really what you need to focus on correcting versus trying to get to into the weeds and get to some of these these other things that I think are going to be less of a return on investment versus the the main four. Yeah, and I didn't maybe touch on it or hit it hard enough, but when I showed those tables from our band versus broadcast study, if you look at those some of those treatments that had very high soil tests, they often had much much greater tissue concentration for that nutrient. But then if you compare that to the actual yield differences, the yield differences are pretty small and probably in some cases not even statistically different. Um, so you can't get too concerned about these tissue test results. Excellent. Uh, well, I, I want to thank you guys. I did put a link to the blog, uh, the Nutrient Management Podcast you mentioned. Uh, there's a, a link in the chat now where you can go over there and I see that interaction episode I've not listened to yet is the first one on there, I believe. And so uh, if you're interested in learning more, I encourage you to get on that nutrient management podcast. Excellent resource, uh, fun to listen to. Again, uh, check that out. I want to thank uh, our, I guess, panelists or speakers today, Dan and Jeff. Uh, thanks for participating. I want to thank all the audience members out there for tuning in. I uh, hope you enjoyed it. There will be a short three question survey once you're done to, uh, to answer and give us any feedback. We'd really appreciate anything there. And I also want to draw one last uh, uh, piece of attention here to the Minnesota Soybean Research and Promotion Council and Minnesota uh, uh, Corn Research and Promotion Council and uh, some of their support they provided today for this, for this program. And with that, uh, we're going to say thanks and we're going we're gonna to sign off. So thank you, everyone.
you know, kind of pulses through that. 